Hello, everyone. My name is Vladimir. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first visit to Canada. And I'm a bit nervous because it's my first talk outside of Russia in English. And probably in front of the audience, they don't know anything about Yandex. Could you please raise your hand if you have ever heard about Yandex? Ah, quite much. That's a surprise. Um, for all others, long story short, Yandex is Russian Google. Uh, our main business is search engine. We are number one in Russia. We are really good in several other countries. You can see some details here. Uh, I'm working as a DBA in the Yandex mail team. We have a mail service. It was launched nearly 16 years ago, so it is quite old. Uh, our daily audience is more than 10 million people, uh, and our backends receive uh, more than 200,000 requests per second. So we think it's quite a high load system. Um, every day we store more than 150 million new letters. These are letters that we store. There are much more that we, much more spam letters that we reject. And our storage uh, right now is more than 20 petabytes in size. So we think of it as a somehow big data service. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, we made a decision to migrate all our metadata from Oracle to Postgres, and we did it. Um, it is nearly 300 terabytes in size with a total workload of 250,000 requests per second. Uh, it is OLTP workload, so small queries. Uh, most of them are read queries. Uh, actually, this is not our first attempt to remove Oracle in our production. More than 10 years we tried to migrate to MySQL, and it failed because I'm at Postgres conference. Uh, and we also saw that we are so cool that we can write our own solution for storing our metadata. Uh, it was really fashionable to write different NoSQL solutions nearly seven years ago, and it also failed. Uh, so what is actually mail metadata? metadata? Um, this is everything you see when you open your inbox. For example, this is folders, which is actually a hierarchy with some counters. This is labels, uh, for example, important letters or unread letters uh, or something else. Uh, this is collectors, a way to collect your letters from other mail services. I'll talk about it a bit later. And of course, letters. We don't store message bodies in our databases. It is stored in our object store. Uh, in databases, we store things that we call envelopes. They contain meta information about the letter. For example, the subject, uh, the recipients from, to, so forth, the first line of the letter, in, uh, dates, uh, different flags, information about attachments, size, and so forth. And uh, letters could be grouped into threads or Somebody called them discussions. Uh, this is a group of letters with the same subject, for example, or something else. Uh, and it is also stored in databases. So how it was nearly four years ago? All this metadata was stored in Oracle. We had lots of PLSQL logic. Uh, these hosts were probably the most efficient hardware usage in all Yandex and uh, probably uh, in many other systems. We used to store more than 10, per, 10 terabytes of metadata per shard. Our working load average was 100. That was not load average when we had any problems. That was a typical normal load average. We have... Uh, 32 cores usually per host. Uh, we, we, we had not so many databases, so lots of operations were done manually. Uh, nearly no automation. And for hardware efficiency, 
uh, we used to divide our databases into warm with SSD disks and cold databases with SATA disks for different type of users. There are users that uh, get registered and then just don't use uh, this mail, uh, this inbox. Uh, so nearly one quarter of our databases were with SATA disks and most of them were with SSD disks. Uh, Sharding is very important for Yandex because we are used to scale horizontally. Um, we used to have the following scheme. When the request comes to one of our backends, uh, the backend uh, changed the auth information to shared name in our internal service called Blackbox. Blackbox is used for checking authentication. Uh, login, password, cookie, all stocking, everything. Uh, in response, backend receives user ID and shared name. It then gives this shared name to Oracle driver. Uh, we, our backends are written in C++, so we use Oracle C++ client interface, OCCI. Uh, OCCI gives the shared name, uh, searches for shared name in a special file, TNS names, and uh, it gets connection strings from there to different hosts. And Oracle driver makes a decision who of the hosts is primary and who is this standby, and uh, it actually opens a connection, opens a connection always to primary. So sharding was implemented with our internal service, and fault tolerance was implemented inside the Oracle driver. Okay. Um, as I already said, most of our applications are in C++ and they had an abstraction library to go to our databases. It is called Max, Meta Access. And for many years, it had the only implementation, Max Aura. Uh, we also used to have a library for implementation of connection pool called dbpool, and on the bottom, of course, we had OCCI. This is how it was designed, but for many years, it became the following. Uh, abstraction leaked. Uh, many of our backends start started using methods of Max Aura or dbpool. We also started having backends in different languages, and of course, they couldn't use C++ library. So we had a mess, and it took us a lot of time to bring order to it. Uh, although Oracle is really good in many things, we had some problems with it. For example, deploy of new code of PLSQL logic was a big pain for DBA because Oracle uses library cache. And when you update some stored processor, for example, lots of other sessions have a share lock on it. And when you deploy new code, you get lots of problems with locking. Uh, as I already said, we didn't have really much automation for uh, most of operations. Switch over, setting new database, transfer between uh, shards were done mostly ma manually. Uh, C++ driver for Oracle has only synchronous interface and uh, most of our applications are based on event loop model or using many asynchronous calls and that was a big problem for us. Uh, since we didn't have much automation for deploying new database, we had problems with development environments. And although Oracle has support, and it is good in many cases, sometimes we had problems with it. For example, when you have a problem and you need to be fixed it very fast because we are a 24 per 7 service, sometimes it, it, it didn't happen. But the main reason is, of course, the price. Uh, Oracle costs are terrifying. If you don't know them, just sleep in peace and don't go there. So, how we did it? Um, in October of 2012, a political decision to get rid of Oracle in three years was made. That was a political decision. That was not a decision to m migrate from Oracle to Postgres. That was a decision get rid of Oracle. 
six months later, six months, half a year, we started first experiments with different databases. That was Postgres, lots of NoSQL databases that were really fashionable that time, and we even tried our self-written solution on base of our search engine. Uh, um, actually, this half a year for this goal were wasted. Uh, we were doing some other useful stuff for improving our stability and for other product launches, but for six months, nothing happened for this goal. And uh, it took us nearly a year to make our first experiment with Postgres. That was collectors. We took small part of our mail metadata uh, and migrated it to Postgres. What is collectors? Collectors is a way to collect your letters from other mail services. For example, if you have an uh, if you have a mailbox on, for example, Gmail and Yandex, you can collect letters from Gmail uh, and see it in Yandex inbox. Uh, that was our first experience with Postgres. We had lots of problems, uh, but we solved it and we really liked it. The experiment was successful. We moved nearly 1% of our metadata to terabytes and with a good workload. It was 40,000 requests per second. Uh, after that, we decided to make a prototype of the whole metadata uh, with folders, labels, letters, and so on and so forth. And we started storing all our letters that are incoming uh, to Postgres. Uh, with, uh, we started it to our object store, to Oracle, and asynchronously to Postgres. Actually, uh, if Postgres would break, nothing would happen because all the workload was served from Oracle databases. And uh, it let us make some initial decisions on our scheme. We didn't just copy that, we were changing it because um, Oracle's scheme was not ideal. Uh, for many years, uh, it was changing. Uh, initial schema decisions was really important for our abstraction library because it is really difficult to do it without understanding the scheme. We also made some load testing under our workload Unfortunately, Oracle license prohibits posting the results, comparing of Oracle with other databases. I could tell you something in private after the talk, maybe. Um, it led us to choose hardware that, would be, that we would use for our Postgres database. And of course, uh, we got a lot of new experience with Postgres. And then we started the main work. It took us a lot of time to rewrite all our backends to use Oracle and Postgres simultaneously. Actually, we understood that we can't migrate 300 terabytes in one night, for example, or something else. And we made the decision that we would have some users that would live in Oracle databases and some users that would live in Postgres databases and a controlled process of migrating them. Um, in June of 2015, we started dog fooding. We moved our inboxes from Oracle to Postgres. Uh, and it really accelerated development. We fixed lots of bugs. We started implementing many new features because we really needed it for ourselves. Uh, sometime later, we started migration of inactive, inactive users. Uh, they live in SATA databases and all the activities they have is receiving new letters. They actually don't come to read them or something else. We didn't have all the features completed by that time, but we, were, we, we started migrating them to Postgres to fix bugs in our transfer code. And of course, we had a rescue plan uh, when, for example, we migrated some user to Postgres and then he started using he, uh, his inbox uh, we had a reverse transfer, we could transfer it back to Oracle. We made it uh, even before we made the main transfer. And then, of course, we made the migration. Some cool things about it. It, take, it took us 10 man years to rewrite all our code. That is a huge amount of time, actually. Uh, and uh, we actually saw that it would 
take nearly half less, but there were some problems with that. But after long rewriting of our code, we had a really fast migration process. This graph shows uh, how many, how much workload uh, is served from Postgres databases overall. Uh, it is divided per service. For, for, for example, how much IMAP workload is served from Postgres databases. And this graph is only for three months. So the main migration process took us nearly three months. That was really quickly. We expected lots of problems and there weren't. There was, that was a really nice surprise for us. Right now, uh, Postgres databases serves, uh, serve nearly more than 95% of our workload, but not all, because new users are still registered in Oracle. They're registered in Oracle and then transferred to Postgres. Uh, while I'm giving this talk here, guys in Moscow are launching registration to Postgres, and after we would do that, we expect to migrate all other users 100% to the 1st of July. So what are the main changes that we made? Uh, first of all, we, bring, we brought order to our abstraction library, and now it has two implementations, one to work with Oracle and one to work with Postgres, max pg. Uh, on the bottom is, of course, libpq, and we also have a header-only library implementing connection pool and timeouts. Uh, sharding and fault tolerance. Fault tolerance was hidden inside the Oracle driver, and Postgres driver can't do that. So what we did, after backend changes auth information to shared name, if the shared name is a magic word Postgres, it goes to extra uh, service. Uh, it is also our internal service that is called SharePA. Uh, the backend gives user ID and the preferred mode. The mode could be give me the primary host, or give me the standby with minimum replication lag, or give me the nearest host, or something else. And SharePA gives back connection strings, uh, or, or one connection string, and the backend opens uh, the connection to, uh, to an appropriate database. Uh, we changed our hardware in several ways. Uh, for example, for Oracle databases, we used to scale vertically because Oracle is licensed by CPU cores. We used to attach lots of SSD disks, lots of network bandwidth, and so on and so forth to one host because and optimize the workload so that the CPU consumption was minimum. Uh, that was a vertical scalability, and we used to have one standby in each shard, one primary and one standby for fault tolerance, because uh, another standby would be expensive. In Postgres, we started having uh, lesser, uh, not so big databases, uh, and we started having two standbys and serving some of read-only workload from our standbys. This approach was so successful that we eventually started doing the same with Oracle in some point of time. Uh, our Oracle databases that will end up in two months uh, now have two standbys also. Another change in the hardware was uh, introducing so-called hot databases. We counted that 2% of our users generate nearly half of our workload. They're really hot, they receive lots of letters, they do lots of operations through IMAP, for example, or mobile applications. And uh, we started having separate databases for them uh, with the hardware optimized for them. And of course, we made automation to move users between different shared types. For example, uh, when you're registered, uh, when you start using uh, mail service, you're put into warm shard. And for example, if you stop using your mail in three months, you would be moved to SATA database. That is made automatically. If, you're, if you live in SATA database and start using your mail, you would be migrated to SSD database in one hour. And one more thing we really want to do is 
uh, migration of old letters of one users from SSD to SATA. Right now, if you are an active user, all your letters are stored on SSD disks. That's not really efficient because you probably don't access to your old letters. Uh, for this to be done, we need normal partitioning in Postgres. We changed our identifiers. In Oracle, they were globally unique. We had different sequences for different shards, and these sequence ranges were stored in a special database. And we had a fuck up when uh, two Oracle shards were using the same uh, sequences for some time, and we spent a lot of time uh, to fix that. Also, all identifiers were quite big. Uh, in Postgres, we changed the approach, and uh, our identifiers are now globally, uh, not globally unique, are unique inside a particular account. For example, uh, message ID was globally unique, and now the unique is a combination of user ID and message ID. It gives us some space economy, and also it, uh, there is an obvious win here. Uh, we have less contention for single index page because when you take your identifiers from a sequence, all of them are inserted to the last single uh, to the last page of the index, to the same page of the index. And to solve this problem in Oracle, we used to have reversed indexes. Uh, in Postgres, we can have normal B3 with normal range scans for them. For that. We added revisions to all our objects. For example, when you mark some letter as read, we also increment the revision of the folder uh, in which letter this is. Uh, this led us to uh, query only actual data from our standbys. You first make a query to the primary, give me revisions of all folders, and then you get data from standby about a particular folder. You can compare the revisions to make a decision if this data is actual or you should reread it from primary. It also made us easier to implement incremental diffs for IMAP and mobile applications. Mobile applications usually, usually come to a server to backend with a query like, give me what was changed from yesterday. Or for example, give me what was changed in uh, in such a folder from such a revision. Uh, revisions made it much easier. We also denormalized some data because Postgres has a good support for arrays and we are heavily using composite types. Here is one of the, here is one of the examples. This is our main table, mailbox, which contains one row per each letter. Uh, as I already said, the globally unique combination is user ID and message ID. And uh, this table also have a field with labels. Uh, on one letter, you can put several labels, so that's an array. And to answer the question, give me all letters with the following label, uh, we have a special gene index. And it's not just gene index, it's gene functional index. <laughs> um, so quite tricky, but it works if you turn off fast update, of course. Um, in Oracle, we couldn't afford the following thing for us. We had a separate table with normalized labels for that. We had lots of stored logic in Oracle. We had lots of pain with it. And when we started uh, our experiments, we were pretty sure that we would have no stored logic in our Postgres database. But PLPG SQL is awesome. It is really much cooler in many things than Oracle PLSQL. And we still have some stored logic in our databases, much less than we used to have in Oracle. Uh, we have logic for ensuring the data consistency. For example, when you store a new letter, you increment uh, counters for an, for an appropriate folder, for example, or something else. So this is implemented inside the databases. This is not the code of our backends. Uh, we also greatly increased test coverage uh, of our stored logic because uh, in Oracle there is an undo, 
And when you have a logically corrupted data, you can restore it from undo. In Postgres, you don't have, so the price, the cost of failure is higher, and we are now writing more tests. Uh, and the main win here is easier deploy since there is no library cache logs. We changed our maintenance approach because we now have much more databases than we used to have. Uh, we used source stack for managing our databases, for managing everywhere on, or, or everything on our databases, sysctls, configs, packets, and so on and so forth. Uh, and at any point of time, we can see a detailed difference between what should be on host and what is really now on host. Uh, that's really convenient. If you change something manually, we can see it in our monitoring solution. Uh, all schema and code changes are now deployed to databases through migrations. We use a tool similar to OptFly. This is an open source solution. Uh, and all the migrations, almost all the migrations, are made transactionally. Uh, we automated all our common tasks, for example, switchovers, failovers, uh, I don't know, reindexing bloated indexes, rebuilding bloated indexes, and so on and so forth. And since we have lots of automation now, we can uh, have a new testing environment in one click. That's really convenient for our developers. So, what problems did we have? We had lots of problems during our experiments. These are links to community threads where, for problems which we couldn't solve ourselves. Of course, there were much more problems that we, that we solved our, uh, ourselves. Uh, we even used to joke that uh, when you don't know what's happening, AutoVacuum is to blame. Because usually when you have some performance problem with your database, you run pg-top, and on the top of uh, the consumption resources, you would see out of vacuum processes. Actually, we had some problems with it, but we solved it. We had a big problem with understanding what is happening inside of our database. Guys from Postgres Pro made a, a solution for that. It is called pg-stat-wait. Uh, you can read about it by the link. Uh, by the first link, and with the great effort of enterprise DB guys, uh, this became part of 9.6. Uh, actually, a small part of it became part of core Postgres, but I hope that it would be uh, developed in the future. We were discussing it yesterday here. Uh, this is not the only tool we use for, uh, for the diagnostics. Uh, I used to give a talk about it, but unfortunately, it's in Russian. You could use Google, uh, sorry, Yandex Translate for that if you, <laughs> or if you are interested in it. We had a problem with our backups. Uh, we want to have an ability to restore at any point of time for the last seven days. And in Oracle, uh, storing all the backups and archive logs for seven days took nearly uh, the same size as the database size. For example, if you have a 15 terabytes database, backups for one week takes 15 terabytes. In Postgres, it is minimum five times more. So for storing backups for our 300 terabytes, we needed two petabytes for backups. Two petabytes just for backups. Of course, we didn't like it. And we made a patch for Barman, and actually, guys from Second Quadrant are not really responsive for us. I hope to talk to them here. Uh, but uh, this patch implements parallelism, compression, and page level increments. Uh, and that lets us to have uh, nearly the same numbers. For example, of right now, for a 5 terabyte database, we have nearly 4 or 5 terabytes of backups for a week. This is so forth because of compression and page level increments. As I already said, we expected to have lots of problem, problems during migration process, but there weren't. That was a nice surprise for us 
Um, there weren't any problems related to Postgres. We had lots of problems with Linux, RAID, uh, hardware, and so on and so forth. Of course, we had lots of problems with, uh, with our data because for many years of developing the service, you accumulate lots of legacy in your data. And of course, we had bugs in transfer code, and we used to fix them. So, we have a list of things that we really want to see in core Postgres for making our life easier. Uh, we want a normal partitioning for moving old letters of a particular user from SSD to SATA. We really want a good recovery manager not implemented in Barman or something else, implemented in core Postgres because some of the features like partial online recovery can't be implemented outside of Postgres. Uh, we want uh, the weight interface, uh, monitoring of weights to be developed in the future, and that was discussed yesterday. Also, partitioning was discussed yesterday, and that's really good. Uh, we want to have an ability to give the huge shared buffers to Postgres with all direct and, the is, and asynchronous I.O. Uh, because on I.O. bound, Postgres is not so good as Oracle, actually. Uh, we also want quorum commit and many other things that don't fit here, but these are the main, actually, and many of them were discussed yesterday and are planned to do in the future, and that's really good. So, for the conclusion, what do we have right now? We moved nearly one petabyte with accounting, standbys, reflex, and indexes. Without it, it is nearly 300 terabytes. Uh, with the workload, nearly 250,000 requests per second. It took us three calendar years and more than 10 million years to do it. But right now we have faster deployment and actually although we have three times more databases, uh, we have the same number of DBAs for uh, managing them. We also made a huge refactoring during the migration process. We haven't had major fuck-ups yet, and that's cool. Um, and Postgres became one of the technologies that are heavily used, uh, of open source products that are heavily used in our production. We use lots of open source technologies, products, and libraries, but uh, the products that are used nearly everywhere in our productions were Linux and Jinx and Postfix. And right now it is also Postgres. And I suppose it's a success. I would be glad to answer your questions. We have right now nearly 90 shards. Uh, uh, one more thing, I remember that I remembered that I need to repeat the question because uh, you couldn't hear. The question was how much of time from these 10 many years was to rewrite the PLSQL? That was nearly two weeks. Uh, that, that was really fast pro process, yes. Uh, that was the initial version. Then we started fixing bugs, writing tests, and adapting our backends. I can't divide this process, um, I can't divide time for these processes, but the initial implementation took nearly two weeks. It was really fast, um, we didn't expect that. Uh, the question is how we get, uh, how we provide consistency while the migration. Actually, when we start the migration, we open a transaction to Oracle database and we are locking the inbox of a particular user. For the period of a migration, his inbox is read only. He don't, uh, the user doesn't receive new letters and can't change anything. But for uh, most of the users who don't have more than 50,000 letters or something else, 
100,000 letters, uh, this process takes several seconds, uh, less than 10 seconds, and uh, read only for 10 seconds is not so big deal. There are large users with more than 20 million users, but they should suffer. <laughs> Uh, actually, as a DBA, we don't like really much uh, users that generate many workload because usually these are users that receive lots of, lots of new letters and they don't read it. They, they never use these letters, uh, but we are a free and limited service and we provide uh, it. So uh, while we are migrating uh, fat users with lots of letters, uh, it can take several minutes, and of course, he is read only during the migration. That is the easiest way to provide consistency. Actually, our migration uh, script, um, our migration tool is nearly 5,000 lines of code. It is already too complicated, and uh, implementing their consistency without going to read only would be really difficult. Uh, well, actually, the metadata is in the database, c contains the storage ID, the link to our object store where the letter is stored. And of course, they are stored in our object store. They are not moved during the migration. We only move the metadata. Okay, the, the question is how, what is the difference between hot databases and warm databases? Uh, they have less SSD disks per CPU core uh, because uh, uh, the, the basic idea here is to find an optimal balance between CPU usage and IO usage. Uh, these are main uh, resources that we consume basically on, on our databases and in warm databases, we can attach more disks to the same CPU counts. And that's it. That's cheaper than hot databases. So, 10 man years with the migration, how long is it going to take until that, until that becomes cheaper than paying the overlap? When do you break it? Uh, okay, the, the, the question was when we. Uh, started paying uh, less money, I, 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 I suppose. Actually, when we did some load testing and we understood that we would need more hardware for uh, Postgres databases, we were happy because the, uh, the number of the hardware that we needed more was uh, much cheaper than uh, the price of Oracle. And uh, it took us 10 million years to rewrite everything, and then we started the migration. And actually, when we migrated the first database, it took us nearly one week, we started uh, the economy of money. And then we just uh, went per database, one by one, uh, migrating all users from one database to several Postgres databases. Did I answer the question? Okay. Sorry? So how much would you say is the overall cost of distribution of Ah, um. Like give a percentage. I mean, you know, a dollar cost of me, like, So, the question is, how much money uh, did we save? Um, Actually, I can't answer your question in strict numbers. That was, that was million of dollars. That was quite much money. And it's also, it's too complicated to count them because we have Oracle in other, our products, mainly internal services, and we have, a, I don't know how to say it in English, sorry. Um, 
we don't pay the full price of the license. We have, sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we have a good discount because we have uh, we have Oracle in, in other services. Uh, but even with with the maximum discount that Oracle can give, seventy percent, we saved millions of dollars. Yes. What is your support of the we have a DBA team. Actually, I'm the head of that team. Uh, that's five people. And uh, these databases, these 90 shards, are not the only databases we have. We have databases of, our, of other services. Uh, we now really love Postgres, but we have many other technologies for storing our databases. So actually, we now have less people for managing more databases. That's a win, I, I suppose. We, we, we don't use any of them. Uh, well, actually, uh, there, is a, there was a, a problem when we started having sick fault in Postgres after upgrading to 9.41. Uh, uh, some of our databases were sick faulting randomly. And we, uh, I reported to PGSQL box, and Tom Lane fixed the bug in 38 minutes. That was nearly 100 times faster than Oracle do. <laughs> also, it has a support which costs lots of money. Tom Lane fixed it much faster, and many thanks to him and many others. No, 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 no. Our shards are dedicated, and they don't have any relationship between each other. So each shard is one primary and two standbys. One of them is synchronous. And one shard doesn't know anything about other shard. And uh, there, is, there is a sharding service uh, called SharePA that knows about all the shards. But uh, uh, one shard doesn't know anything about other shards. Because all current solutions don't really work on, on a huge workload. Uh, I suppose that will happen in the nearest future. I hope it will happen, but right now it's not. No, 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 no. A schema change is made shard per shard. So we deploy new code or uh, some DDL on one shard. Uh, and then to the other, and so on and so forth. And of course, our applications uh, support working with old schema and new schema, because it is impossible to do that at once in a high load production. Yes? So, sorry? Yes, we use uh, we use a self-written tool. We call it PG Migrate, and uh, the principle of work is really uh, near to OptFly. You have a separate table in your database. It is called Schema Version, and all your changes that you do is done through migrations. So, for example, you add a new column you, to, to the table. You want to add a column to the table you make a new migration. And when uh, PG Migrate is launched, it goes to this table and sees that uh, the last migration was number nine, and on the file system there is migration number 10, and it applies it. It adds the column to the, uh, and it is heavily uh, related to our salt stack, uh, to our managing system, so that uh, deploying new code is a one click.
I suppose we have ran out of time. Uh, I would be here today and tomorrow, and, and you could ask any questions, me in private. Thank you.